Episode 5, Battery, Harmful or Offensive Contact. In this episode, we're going to dig a little deeper into battery by focusing on the meaning of harmful or offensive contact. Remember that all but one of the elements of battery are basically the same as those for the other traditional intentional torts, act, intent, and causation. The key element that sets battery apart from the others is the consequence that occurs, harmful or offensive contact with the person of another. To understand the harmful or offensive contact element, as well as what constitutes harmful or offensive contact for the purposes of establishing intent to cause a harmful or offensive contact, we have to answer two what basic questions. What counts as contact? What counts as contact? What counts as harmful or offensive? Let's start with contact. The easy case for establishing contact is one where there is a physical touching between the defendant's body and the plaintiff's body. My fist punching your face, for example, or my foot kicking your shin. But the plaintiff can establish contact in other ways, too. The contact element does not necessarily require bodily contact between the defendant and the plaintiff. There are two ways that the contact requirement can be stretched to accommodate particular circumstances that courts commonly deem to be battery. First, where there is a force set in motion by the plaintiff. And second, where there is contact with an item closely associated with the plaintiff's person. The force set in motion approach is pretty obviously sufficient to establish battery when you think about it. For example, when I pull the trigger on a gun that's pointed at you, I don't cause a physical contact between my body and yours, but a battery occurs all the same. By pulling the trigger, I set the bullet in motion, causing it to come into contact with your body. Another classic example is a case where the defendant pulls a chair out from under the plaintiff just as he's sitting down. The defendant doesn't actually touch the plaintiff, but by pulling the chair out from under him, she acts with substantial certainty that her action will cause the plaintiff to come into contact with the floor. Here's the trick, though. The more indirect the contact is, the more invasive it must be. In cases where the contact caused by the defendant's act is diffuse and indirect, courts typically require that the defendant have intentionally aimed the force at someone, though not necessarily at the plaintiff. Remember person-to-person transferred intent. Another way of thinking about this would be to say that where the contact is indirect and diffuse, substantial certainty, acting in spite of the knowledge that contact is virtually certain to occur, may not always be enough. The plaintiff may need to establish that the defendant actually desired for the contact to occur. The items closely associated with the plaintiff's person approach may be a little less intuitive. There are quite a few battery cases where courts have found the contact element to be satisfied by the defendant's contact with items that are closely connected to the plaintiff and identified with the plaintiff. For example, the plaintiff's clothing, or an object held in the plaintiff's hand, or a horse on which the plaintiff is sitting, or maybe even an item that is associated with the plaintiff and located within the plaintiff's personal space. For example, if I snatch a pen out of your hand without actually touching you, then that's probably sufficient to establish contact. When the contact requirement is stretched in this way to accommodate contact with items connected to or closely associated with the plaintiff's person, courts often emphasize that the contact has to be carried out in a rude or offensive manner. So if I take a pen that's right next to your hand, but I do so in a gentle way, that's unlikely to be battery. But if I snatch the pen from its location next to your hand while glaring into your eyes with a sneer and a generally gruff manner that indicates my actions are aimed at you personally rather than at getting a pen I need, then that might be battery. Another way of describing the two kinds of stretching of the contact requirement 
is to say that the more indirect the contact is, the higher the bar for establishing that it is harmful or offensive. So how do we decide whether contact is harmful or offensive? Note the or. The plaintiff doesn't have to show that the contact is both harmful and offensive. One or the other is sufficient. Harmful contact is pretty easy to understand. If I punch you in the face and give you a bloody nose, that's harmful. If I trip you and cause you to break your arm, or if I push you down a flight of stairs, that's harmful. The trickier cases are usually about whether contact that is not harmful is nonetheless offensive. Whereas harmfulness can be judged relatively easily, did the contact cause physical pain or damage to the plaintiff's body? Offensiveness can be more difficult to judge. Courts typically describe the test for offensiveness in terms of what would be offensive to an ordinary person not duly sensitive as to personal dignity. This is essentially the same as the reasonable person standard that is so crucial to negligence law. Under this test, offensiveness is highly dependent on context, including the social setting and the relationship between the parties involved, things that might be appropriate under some circumstances. For example, shoving a friend as part of a game of tag on the playground might be clearly inappropriate under other circumstances, like shoving a friend in the classroom. A kiss on the cheek might be appropriate if the defendant and plaintiff are dating, or even if they're friendly acquaintances, but not if they're total strangers. Note that this assessment easily bleeds over into analysis of implied consent as a defense to battery something we'll address in a future episode. Keep in mind that the question is not whether the plaintiff was actually offended. There are many reasons why a subjective test for offensiveness wouldn't be a good idea from a policy perspective. The plaintiff is highly motivated to claim that he was in fact offended, and it's difficult to assess his subjective state of mind. Instead, the question is whether a somewhat imaginary, reasonable person in the plaintiff's position would have been offended by the contact under the circumstances. And that under the circumstances language is crucial. In this area and in many others, tort law expresses and enforces social norms about what kinds of conduct are appropriate or inappropriate. And those social norms can vary from place to place or over time. So while a kick on the playground might have been seen as appropriate 30 years ago, now with changing attitudes about bullying, it might not be seen that way anymore.